Welcome to Celebrating Act Two, where John Coleman and I get to speak to the virtual gourmet, John Mariani. Morning, John. Good morning. Speaking of virtual gourmet, a lot of people don't know that that is the name of your weekly free newsletter to be found at johnmariani.com. johnmariani.com, free subscription. And, and now they know. Uh, so I'm a big fan of your newsletter, read it every week, and love love a lot of things about it. But one of the things I like is that you have a couple of associates mm -hmm. who you publish regularly, um, including a guy named John Curtis, who covers uh, usually Las Vegas. Am I correct? Well, he lives in Las Vegas, so he covers all that. But John uh, is spends all of his disposable income. He's a lawyer, so imagine what that is. Uh, on eating around the world as often as possible. And spending. Well, that's what I was going to mm -hmm. say. His, his most recent article, actually a two-parter, which was great, uh, was about dining around in London. And I found it fascinating um, because, you know, with COVID and all, a lot of people haven't been, haven't been traveling. We're getting back to it now. And I wondered uh, about that dining scene, if you would share with us John's... Uh, and your experiences in in Britain currently after COVID, uh, has it all come back the way the U.S., we were talking about the U.S. In restaurant industry has come back uh, gangbusters. How's Britain doing? Britain is doing extremely well. There was an article in this morning's uh, London Times, which I read religiously. It's a great newspaper because it really gives you a European perspective. And of course, if they're being British, they're very society uh, conscious, and it's an article about if you want to get into uh, certain hot restaurants, you're either going to have to wait, 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 because they're so overwhelmed and popular, or you've got to pay off big time. I mean, 50 pounds will barely get you in the door. Wow. Uh, of course, 100 pounds to get a so-called good table. So they're doing just fine over there, despite the fact that, as we mentioned about in the U.S., um, lunch is way off. Um, they're not the businessmen and women are not going out to lunch. But aside from that, um, um, and you could just as with any newspaper, look about the new openings. I live here in Westchester County and every week or two um, right here in the county, here are the new restaurants opening in the next week. And there's six to eight of them every wow. single week. Some of them yeah. are shops, a bagel shop, but most of them are real live restaurants. So yeah, London is doing great. Yeah, it's an international city of great moment, and they have their enormous economic problems um, there because of Brexit and uh, and COVID and the Ukrainian war and so forth. But London's restaurant scene is hot as ever. I mean, so should... when I yeah, go ahead. When I go to London, I will have plenty of upscale fine dining to choose from. And I'll still be able to get bangers and match at a local pub. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. um, London. Uh, some of uh, you know the, the tradition or the the reputation for British food was so bad for so long, so long that some people who have not been to London or the British Isles in 20 years are just talking into their hat because they don't know anything about how good the food and restaurants are there. Um, about 60, 70 years ago, one wag said, if you want to eat well in England, have breakfast three times a day. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> uh, that was once true to a certain extent because the British were not taking advantage of the remarkable resources they have uh, in terms of their own provender, their coastlines. Now they do. Having said that, because Britain was once a great colonial power, uh, they dr have drawn to it for decades uh, the best Indian restaurants, best Celanese restaurants, um, Chinese restaurants, Japanese restaurants, uh, North African restaurants. I mean, they have uh, as good uh, a slew of those kinds of restaurants uh, as Los Angeles has or Portland or any place on the West Coast drawing on uh, Asia for um, inspiration. So there is that. And there are some that go way, way back. A favorite place of mine called Vera Swami, <clears throat> which is as good an Indian restaurant as you'll ever find. Um, so much so that what's curious is that in India itself, where I have not been for many, many years, India itself is now vastly improving its own cuisine and restaurants modeled on 
those restaurants you would find any restaurants in places like London. Uh, they're much more stylish and they're much more regional because in Indian food has generally been um, the kind of Indian food you go to the Indian, you know, the Calcutta Inn around the corner there in uh, California is going to be based on Mughal food, which is kind of a diluted Persian type of food because the Mughals control so much of northern India for so long. And that's yeah. what the British came in. Uh, but now that's radically different. But what John Curtis, uh, who was just reporting on uh, Paris too. Um, how far we can talk about that at another time, about what a real Parisian meal means these days. But John likes, as do I, to go back to the old established restaurants to see are they still any good or were they all that good to begin with. So he went to one of my favorite places, Wilton's, uh, which is on, um, uh, it, which is in London, on German Street. And you walk in there and you think you walked into a Dickens novel, a good Dickens novel, <laughs> not taking place in a, in a black. And uh, it is it looks the way you think you think you're going to see Trevor Howard over there dining with Sean Connery. And you well may, <laughs> um, except they're both dead. So if they're if they're there, you might want to. Uh, but it's beautifully wood paneled. The service staff is impeccably dressed. I think they still have swallowtail, some of the um, people, um, beautiful young women and young men who are as attentive as anything you could possibly imagine. The food is largely British continental French based on, again, the very finest British game. So, so if you want venison, if you want duck or in grouse season, you go to Wilton's, Wilton's and you'll have it. Fantastic. There'll be potted shrimp. There'll be kakaliki soup. Um, there'll be wonderful puddings, um, great sausages. And then they'll wheel out the cheese court, which is going to have Gloucester and it's going to have cheddar and it's going to have Shropshire and it's going to have Stilton on it. Um, it's just a great, great place. And it's, it's, it's better than ever. Um, John also went to Rules which is not quite as famous for his food as for the fact that it's probably the oldest restaurant in London. I mean, we're talking 18th century. Uh, they all sorted out as taverns and, and, and pubs, but over the centuries in this case, um, they've grown in and grown to be fine restaurants. And again, you walk in, in there and you think you're just in a 19th century novel or a 20th century novel written by uh, Oberon War, Evelyn War, um, uh, another wonderful place. He also went to St. John, which has only really been around for about 20 years, but St. John revolutionized uh, British dining uh, because the owners uh, said, you know, we're not going to put any frou-frou on the plate at all. We are not French. We're not going to do reductions of sauces. We are just going to serve the best British provender seafood, and especially meats, and every variety of meat, including the kidneys, including the brains, including the sweetbreads, etc. And we're going to cook it impeccably and put it on the plate with wonderful um, uh, English or Irish potatoes with the most superb butter from our dairies. And that's what you're going to get on the plate. And then you tell us this is not great food. Well, it is. It's very basic. And I mean, you don't have to order the kidneys. I don't like kidneys. Um, but if you are so inclined, that's the place to, in fact, uh, uh, have it. Um, he went to, <coughs> excuse me, the Walsley, which has never, ever had an empty table, except during um, COVID, um, where the prices are high, but not outrageous. They open for breakfast. They're especially known for their breakfast and for lunch and for dinner. And it is packed with celebrities on any, there's an article in today's London Times, as I said, which on any given day, you're going to see half the people from the art galleries and museums there. Oh, there's Elizabeth Hurley over there. Uh, oh, there's that director. Uh, oh, that ar artist is over there. Lucian Freud is, is over there in his regular booth where he always sits. And you're going to eat, um, again, a version of, um, uh, of British food, impeccably prepared and so beautifully served. I mean, the British are known to be snobby and about class, they certainly are. Um, they 
definitely have their ideas about class, but you can rise in class by doing by achievement um, uh, or having lots of money, which always really, really helps. <laughs> The Walsley is a place that you can go for that reason. Uh, and then as for the bangers and mash, John, as you said, um, many, many years ago, a huge thick book is over 500 pages I'm looking at now. It's called The Good Pub Guide for all of England and, and the British Isles. And when it started out like 40 years ago, it just meant yeah, it is a good pub, you know, and uh, go in here and you're going to get good shepherd's pie and so forth. Well, over the years, some of the best food in, in England is being served in these pubs. Um, sometimes it's going to be shepherd's pie, but it's going to be really, really excellent shepherd's pie. And those sausage and bangers and mash are going to be made from the, the best cuts of, of, uh, of beef uh, from great sausage makers and cheese makers on the plate. So um, when you say good pub, buy, uh, good pub guide now, um, anywhere, they really are finding the best pubs, not just a place to have a pint. Well, good on you, mate. Oh, that's Australian. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I spent uh, maybe, uh, I had a half a dozen decent trips to uh, uh, the London area uh, uh, back at the, at the close of the last century when I had uh, a partnership with some uh, people over there in the electronics firm. And I was always struck because it was the British Empire. Uh, it was quite extensive for what, 100 years or more, that there was food of every stripe. And quite frankly, I don't remember uh, having had a bad meal. I didn't do a lot of fine dining, uh, as you might do. Uh, but uh, I, I would go out to a variety of restaurants, and there'd always be something that you felt was authentic to the region that it came from. So they have this great diversity. Uh, and always have, so I'm surprised that there's even a question that you can get a decent meal in uh, London. Well, they're famous for their curry houses. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, uh, curry houses uh, were places that, uh, when I first, my first trip to London, I was about 18, 19 years old, and everything uh, everything in London seemed to cost a pound. <laughs> one pound for my room, <laughs> one pound for my meals, and I used to go around the corner in uh, Brompton Road, and there was a curry house there, and I loved it. I ate there like three times a, three times a week um, because it was so cheap and it was so good. It was so dependable. Um, Indian food has gotten much more sophisticated and regional since then, as you mm -hmm. indicate. Um, but, yeah, uh, the, the, having colonies once helped. John, great look at London. Thank you. Thanks so much for, the, for having me. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.